Hey guys, this is Duke from Gas Mask Bunker, and some of you may remember that I've already done an XM53 review in the past, but this one is a bit different, and those of you keen of eye may already be able to tell why, but we're going to go ahead and get into the history of this example and why this one's so important. So picture this. It's the early 2000s. The British company Avon Rubber had just landed the contract with the U.S. Army to experiment with the then-ongoing XM50 Joint Service General Purpose Mask program, and it's going pretty well for them. The Army is very interested. Several of the prototypes already show promise, so much so that the Joint Special Operations Command is already showing interest in the, in the platform as well. But they're not quite pleased with it. They're quite uh, unsatisfied with its limited range of features and its... Uh, lack of capability, and they're wanting to really push and extend it to the capability that they have with the M45 mask to have a more suitable replacement, but with an upgraded design. So in comes the XM53 Improved Protective Mask Program, which I would assume, just based off of what I've been able to categorize and document, started sometime around 2003, potentially even earlier. I'm not entirely sure, as there's very little documentation in terms of when dates began. However, around that time, we find a series of distinct and individual differences in the various prototypes that were trialed for the XM53 program, and it was driven exceedingly fast. There was a very few number of amendments in the design before it was ultimately finalized in 2005 and 6, and it was ultimately put into production beginning around 2007. The, the prototypes that lead up to the final M53 can be broken up into at least four different key developments. First, there is the Early User Assessment XM53, which more or less resembles a C50 in its overall construction. Uh, there, next up is the uh, Proposal Design, which hasn't really been uh, constructed as far as I'm aware. It's more or less a concept that they tinkered with and, and ways to account for the shortcomings of the EUA XM53. There's what you see here, which is called the SDD XM53, or System Dis uh, Development and Demonstration XM53, which is more or less just a major improvement to the previous design that sort of accounted for all the previous shortcomings, as mentioned before. And then there is the final XM53, which would ultimately be, uh, get rounded out and finalized as the M53 we know today. Uh, this example, as mentioned before, is an SDD XM53 that as from what I've been told, was actually previously owned and used by a former Delta Force operator, uh, and it has been on display since 2004, and unfortunately I do not have the kick-ass plaque that he had with it. I really would have loved to buy that, but uh, you can have this photo of it at least. But anyways, this example belonged to, obviously, a member of the, uh, of the unit, and I'm very, very happy to own this and show it off for you guys in all of its detail. And boy, there is a decent bit of detail to show off for you guys because there was a lot of interesting things in this prototype that it were omitted from the final design and it's a little bit sad because there was a lot of nice things that this early prototype had and why don't we get right on into it so right off the bat most of you are probably already asking about the voice projection unit as you can see on the front here there's no holes those of you that are familiar with the m53 know that it has a distinct speaker hole uh, grill on the front of the voice projection unit and you also may notice that the polarity of the switches is reversed, whereas uh, with the XM53 VPU, it is down for off, up for on, and it's completely opposite on the finalized VPU. And the reason uh, for the lack of holes, I bet you're wondering, is does the sound come through the plastic? No, actually. I've actually taken the screws off of this mounting plate on the back here, and as you can see in the photo I have up on screen, there is a, actually a giant hole where the speaker is, and that's where the sound comes through, and it's simply deflected around that back mounting plate here, and it comes out the front through this little sliver here. And it's actually quite clever how they did that. It's very reminiscent of the uh, the PSM for the S10 and FM12 masks, so it's something that Avon was already quite familiar with in terms of sound deflection. But sadly, it wasn't uh, a finalized design, which is kind of sad because this is a very kick-ass design. I absolutely love just the, the blank... Uh, the VPU design, it's just very intimidating and mysterious, if you ask me. It just it just seems so censored. But anyhow, on the side here, pretty much not a lot has changed in terms of its layout. It, it structurally very much is a finalized M53, just with a few details in terms of its uh, mold details and its uh, the, the way the hood attaches to the face piece, so, and obviously the VPU. There was some differences with the drinking tube, not very much, but... If you look very closely and compare it to the finalized drinking tube, if I can pull this out, 
the point at which the drinking tube attaches, to prevent that from falling over, uh, this little stem here where you can grip onto it to pull it out is a bit thinner on the prototype. So I guess they were worried about that breaking off and causing damage to the mask. So they, they kind of beefed it up, which it, I will admit this is a lot easier to grab than the finalized one. So a little bit upsetting that they did that, but I can understand why they needed to in case of people breaking them off. Uh, the drinking lever and the uh, pass-through communications connection isn't all that much different. However, there is slight difference in the connector itself. I will try and take the VPU off to show you guys. Give me one moment. So bringing the VPUs up closer here, you can see that there's some slight difference in the connectors and this one has a more plastic bodied housing with a uh, crimp ring to hold it in together. Whereas this one is just entirely molded plastic as one piece. It's not two separate pieces that are sort of clamshelled together. And there's some slight differences in markings on the back there. Screws are a little bit rusty on this prototype one, but that's that's all, that's all right. You can't expect everything to be perfect. But very much they're functionally the same. And the prototype VPU is actually a bit louder. So they actually had to tone down the uh, the voice volume for the, uh, the finalized version for whatever reason. But that's uh, another difference I noticed. And unfortunately, I can't really... I'm not going to be demonstrating that in this video. The VREU is more or less the same. Uh, it functions the same. The thickness of this bar here, this, this little knob to turn it, is a bit thicker. I have actually attempted to put a VREU lever on the XM53. It just does not fit. Uh, in case you're wondering about this green color on mine, I just color that in with a, uh, a paint marker. I've seen a lot of SOF guys do that for whatever reason. It makes it easier to tell which way it's facing, so never mind about that. And another thing you may be noticing is the hood. The hood is a level of complexity all to its own when compared to the finalized M53 hood. Uh, the main difference that you may notice is this drawstring around the neck to cinch it up, which is a little bit of a, uh, a nice addition. Uh, there are some differences in the webbing, uh, but most of all the secondary skin, whereas you can see the second skin on the finalized hoods is made out of a butyl material. It's a solid molded butyl, which is sewn into the Gore Chem Pack, whereas this uh, is made out of a sort of wetsuit neoprene material where it's got like a nylon coating on one side and then it's uh, smooth neoprene rubber on the inside. And it's, it's completely hand cut. I'm not going to take this thing off because it is a pain in the ass to get back on and it doesn't sit perfectly. But if you look on the side here, you can see that this thing is very much hand cut. They, this, the holes do not align correctly. I've actually tried to put this on over the canister port here. It just does not want to fit in place, unfortunately, but that definitely gives it a lot of character in terms of the hand cut and very custom in the, like on the job made sort of things that they did for, for making these prototypes. And another thing you may notice is these stripes on the nose. We call these tiger stripes. It's a, it really offers nothing in terms of its integrity. Uh, it's just more there for aesthetics. And I really honestly wish they kept these because by God, they are aesthetic. So just to give you a comparison to the finalized M53, the tiger stripes are sadly no longer present. If you may remember in the previous video of uh, the XM, the final XM53 that I reviewed, you can see that there was marks where those tiger stripes once were, but they were omitted from the mold design. The outsert is not all that much different. The lens is actually overall a little bit wider. Like it's slightly taller uh, in terms of its uh, up and down vision. So uh, I'm not sure whether that's just tolerances of the upgraded molds or if that was intentional, but nevertheless, the lens is slightly larger on the prototype. Uh, externally, there's not much else to see that I can show off without inverting the hood, because that's where all the real magic happens is once we look underneath the hood. So I will go ahead right now and pause the video so you can see that. So see you then. Okay, now that I have the mask off of the head and on the table here, I can invert the hood and show off the finer details of this thing. So before I do that, let's take a closer look at the hood drawstring. Unfortunately, mine is quite damaged here. As you can see, it's sort of hanging on by a literal thread because the elastic is sort of overshot the actual point where it's supposed to be attached to the hood. So there's literally just the, the uh, fabric sheath for the elastic sort of just dangling there. Uh, and you can see the, the uh, cord lock for the drawstring. And on the interior, there is a stamp. This is made by Aerostar Specialty Products of South Dakota, USA. And that hot air balloon logo is no coincidence because this hood is actually made by a hot air balloon manufacturer. If you look into this company, that is what they do. Uh, and it's in remarkably good condition for its age and for its being tested heavily by special forces. 
there is a bit of separation of the mesh material from the Gore Chem Pack, so that is a bit unfortunate, but it's still all there. There's nothing missing. Uh, I'll give you a closer look at the bottom of the uh, the drinking and microphone port there on the uh, bottom, and close up of all the details. There's no uh, unlike the standard M53s. There's no Avon logo or uh, serial code or stamps on this right here. This is all you know, prototype test stuff. And you can see on top here, this neoprene second skin is held in place with a thin piece of shock cord. Uh, you can get a better look at those tiger stripes there because you're not going to be able to see these on any other M53. And just a bare uh, cheek on the side here. On the molded butyl second skins, they would put an M or just some sort of size designator for what size it was, which is convenient. And then the other thing to take note of is the top of the hood. So you notice that there's these two patches here, and that's no coincidence because the SDD XM53 used two hood retention tabs, whereas you might recall with the M53, it only uses one on top. I'm not sure why they needed to go that route. It's a, There's just so much with this hood that's entirely overkill for what they needed to do, but nevertheless, that's what they designed it to do, uh, and they ultimately thought that they re realized, hey, this is a bit too much. We're going to tone it back a little bit. And the other thing they did to help keep the hood in place is on the sides here. There is two sort of uh, buttons on the sides here that hold the hood in place. I will reverse the hood so you can actually see this better. So as you can see, there is a plastic stud that fits through a um, sort of tab with a hole through it uh, that would allow the hood to be further uh, retained to the face piece of the mask itself. It was entirely overkill, and once they designed a better secondary skin that actually worked with the M53 face piece, this was entirely a redundant feature, and they saw the unnecessary nature of it. But now that we have the the hood inverted, we can invert the harness, but not before showing it off, because there's really not that much to see in terms of what the harness has to offer. It's pretty close to what the final design was. There's not really much changed. Just some minor material differences. You can see it's sort of a navy blue color, which is kind of nice. I kind of wish they stuck with this. But nevertheless, let's take a look on the inside of the mask and show off what it has to offer. So, some of you may have already noticed from the exterior view that the nose cup is much different. You can see it has these deflector wings on the sides, and then it also has these two little round bumps where presumably nose cup valve discs would be. And that is no coincidence because this nose cup is recycled from the mold used for the nose cup on the early user evaluation uh, uh, XM53. So those would have originally had a layout similar to the M45 where two nose cup valve discs would be on one side and the air would have to pass over from the canister inlet across the lens and into the nose cup. But they ultimately decided to reduce the cost of production. Uh, they experimented with just punching a hole on the top here, and that is what stuck with the final design. So they upgraded the nose cup, and honestly, I like this nose cup a little bit more. It's way more comfortable, and it functions way better. Even though it's not the, uh, the EUA design, uh, where it has the valve discs on one side, and it just has a hole on the top, I just find this nose cup a bit more comfortable on me personally, even though it's not a large, because on a normal M53, I personally fit a medium face piece with a large nose cup. But this is all medium, all straight throughout, and this one fits me just perfectly fine, so a little bit irritated at that. And even the rubber is a bit better quality on this prototype as well. Like, it's not as sticky, it's very smooth, very supple, just very overall great quality when compared to the final production designs. Um, this particular example, as I mentioned before, is dated 2004, and as with the last XM53 review, the way to figure out the date stamps is on the interior of this cheek waffle here, where the canister port is opposite to, and as you could hopefully see there, you could see a date stamp of 2004, SDD for, uh, for, um, uh, what did I say that stands for? Uh... I said it at the beginning, I put some text up on screen, because I'm, I'm a forgetful person. So... That's how, you be, how you're how you able to date these earlier prototypes, whereas the uh, the finalized version of the M53, obviously, as mentioned in my M53 videos, they would put a date stamp just below the lens where it's a little bit easier to find, but I don't know, if you ask me, I kind of like it inside the cheek waffle. It's a bit convenient there. Um, the only other thing that I really analyze, I suppose, is the canisters. Now, at first glance, there doesn't appear to be much difference between the two canisters physically, but where they really show their differences is on the labeling. So on a standard production GPCF50 canister, 
you see a lot number, a serial code, barcode, and you have a warning label of some sort. And on this prototype example, here we can see just a simple barcode sticker, and then you have the the type of carbon that it has in it, ASZM TEDA carbon, and then Rev C almost definitely stands for revision C. So this is like the third revision of this particular canister that they were testing. So very interesting to see that. No no other differences as far as I'm aware, at least physically, as I said. So we can stop talking about that. But um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I missed with this example. I think that there really isn't too much else different about it. I'm probably going to think of something later when this video is over and I'm going to be kicking myself in the butt, but in which case, feel free to ask me questions down in the comments below if there's anything that you realize that I didn't. Um, but that's really all. I guess I could just show off the microphone. Not very much different from the finalized one, the drinking tube as well. The actual VREU buffer throughout the back there is a bit different as well because it is, it is made out of a black silicone rubber, whereas the finalized ones were made out of orange silicone. So not much to see there. And there's the, uh, <clears throat> the airflow deflector on the side. That's about it, really. So I think we can just about wrap things up here. So um, I guess the only other thing to mention is the carrier, which unfortunately this one doesn't have. This probably would have had one of the uh, experimental joint service general purpose mass carriers that were made by Paraclete. Uh, I don't have one of those, and I don't know where to get one of those. They're probably very rare, just like this mask, so that's unfortunate. My only other guess as to what these what carriers would have gone with this is probably perhaps one of the M40 soft shell carriers, which is kind of what I currently have it with, but I'm not sure if that's accurate. I've never actually seen the, what was supposed to be the full kit for one of these, so... Um, <clears throat> but this is definitely more than most people are going to see on an average basis, so I'm very happy to show this off for you guys, and of course... If there is anything that I hadn't mentioned, uh, feel free to point it out to me. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns, as always, drop them down in the comments below. I'm Duke, and I will see you all later.